What up, we bleed green gang? All my subscribers, everybody that's down with the Philadelphia Eagles, man. I've been off this YouTube thing for a while now, but I'm back with my first vid. Got back in my football mood. We got preseason on Thursday, but um, I'm doing this video because I'm gonna call it the Michael Kendricks, um, probably the Michael Kendricks fiasco. Of course, y'all all know we're dealing with the situation with Kendricks requesting a trade, you know, all of the rumors swirling, Kendricks need to get traded, Kendricks might get released, like, um, Kendricks is washed up, this, that, and the third, um, but, things like that make me, um, lead me to do videos like this one, so, uh, this is just a, a um, I don't know how long it's gonna be, but, this is just a um a video discussing the pros and the cons, the ups and downs, basically of Michael Kendrick's career and like what I feel like um my opinion on what should happen or what shouldn't happen. Now, um Michael Kendrick is a player we drafted in the second round, 2012. Of course, you know we drafted Vinnie Curry um in the second round too that year, and our first round pick that year was um Fletcher Cox. You know what I'm saying? So now that was the year we went four and twelve, I believe. Um Andy Reid was fired, Chip Kelly was hired, um Jim Washburn was fired. Um I believe that was the first year we um maybe not the first year. I'm not sure, but uh we ran the wide nine scheme. So Michael Kendricks, you got a guy coming out of um Cal, you know, speedster. He did his uh, he did his combine, and he was he was he had a reputation of a fast, fast linebacker. Like so, when we brought him here, he automatically um he automatically came here as a guy that we was gonna have out there in coverage on um against tight ends. Now um, the thing about Michael Kendricks now he turns twenty seven in September this year, next month. So he's still a he's still a young guy. You know what I mean? He's been here since he was 21, I believe. So he had a rough up and down career here in Philadelphia. He's still he's still here now. But the first thing I'm going to say is um the pros and cons of Michael Kendricks in my eyes. Now I'm gonna start with the cons. We all know Michael Kendricks is injury prone. You know what I mean? He he gets a lot of soft tissue injuries, a lot of nagging injuries, and he misses he misses games due to the fact that he's um, injured a lot. That's one of the cons and one of the knocks on Michael Kendricks. Another knock on Michael Kendricks to me, I realized when he got here he was fast, but against the better tight ends in the NFL, he was always mismatched. You know what I mean? So, like, you'll see Kendricks go up against a Jason Witten or a guy like of that caliber big name tight ends and he would struggle based on his um, height disadvantage you know what I mean because he's 5'11 and you know you got the best tight ends in the NFL 6'4, 6'5, 6'6 even though tight ends not usually fast but he was mismatched due to his size disadvantage now that's another knock on Kendricks that I have and one more knock I have on Michael Kendricks that we all have is he misses a lot of tackles like he he's like I said, I'm gonna get to the pros in a minute, but those are those are my main three knocks on Michael Kendricks. You know his his size disadvantage when it comes to dealing with the better tight ends in the NFL. His um his uh, injury his injury prone his history and his uh tackle his tackling issue. Now the pros of Michael Kendricks. He's a fast linebacker, probably one of the fastest linebackers in the NFL. He run, ran a 4-4 at the uh, scouting combine. Um, he's a great blitzer. Like, he's a great he, – he can rush the court. He's a great blitzer, you know what I mean? And, you know, it was a certain point in his career where he was getting a, he was getting a lot of tackles. But it was, it was even a point on the Eagles where he was our best defensive player at one point. You know what I mean? So – the pros of Michael Kendricks is he's a fast linebacker, so you can use a guy like that in a lot of situations, which leads to his ability to be 
to blitz with the best of them. You know what I mean? He could be a blitzing linebacker when he needs to be. Um, his speed. And I think he matches up better against running backs. You know what I mean? Like, of course, y'all know in 2014 when D'Amico Ryans went down and Kendricks took over the reins as the um, the signal caller. You know, he was up against running backs. And I think he's better matched up against running backs. Um, and that should have been their the mentality of the team a year later when we... Uh, When um, we released D'Amico Ryans. But now, I'm going to get into his career stats real quick. Because I ran some, I did, I wrote all his numbers down and I did the math and everything. So, in Kedrick's first year, played in 15 games, he started 14. 2013, played in 15 games, started all 15 of them. 2014, he played in 12 games, started in 11 of them. 2015, he played in 13 games and started all 13 of them. And, of course, last year, you know, he played in 15 games, but he only started eight. Now, above all, that's 80 games in five NFL seasons, theoretically. Kendrick's played in 70 games. Whether he was injured, whether he just sat down, I don't – but mainly because he was injured, he missed um, games. And he started 61 games out of the 70 that he played in. Now, um, for his career, he has 382 total tackles, 288 total solo tackles, and 94 tackles assisted. So, I ran the numbers on that, which, me, which leads me to the 70 games he played in. On average, for his career, he averages five and a half tackles a game. This is all with 2016 being a down year. Now, as far as the 288 solo tackles, which brings his average to 4.1 solo tackles a game. And 1.4, basically 1.4, one and a half assisted tackles per game for his career. Now, as far as sacks for his career, he has 12. His career high was... Four sacks in the season two times. That was 2013-2014. He has 20 pass deflections for his career. His career high was actually in his rookie year. When um you know when we ran the four three, the last year of Andy Reid, 2012. He had nine pass deflections that year. Um his for his career he has three interceptions, which is also his career high because he only he had all of those interceptions in 2013. Basically, I'm going to sum it up with 2013 being Kendrick's best year. That was the best year he had in the NFL so far this year. He had about, a, what, 104 tackles that year. You know, and like I said, his missed tackles, his missed tackles, he would have a lot more tackles in his career, but he misses a lot of tackles. But he is a, he is a pretty good tackler. It's just with the injuries and coming back into the game, like, he's so fast, like, he'll over-pursue and miss the tackle. He won't get his leverage right here, Mr. Tackle. But for the most part, he is a pretty good tackler, career-wise. You know what I mean? And for his career, he has six forced fumbles. Um, his career high was three in 2014. Now, um, I did one more numbers thing, which involved his sacks for his career. He averages two, basically 2.4, two and a half sacks a, um, a season in his five-year career. And that's what not getting a single sack this year. So basically all his sacks came in his first four seasons. Because, you know, he had this, his down year last year. Now um, now that I done ran the numbers by y'all, this is why I chose to do this video. Because I decided to go through his career based on, like, my common knowledge and everything that I can say off the top of my head in his career. Now, Kendrick's always played, um, he played three years in the 3-4 and he played two years, his first year and his last season, in a 4-3. Now, coming into the NFL, into a 4-3, um, I read that it was Washburn scheme, but I don't think it was Washburn scheme. I think when we went 4-12, and um, Juan Castillo was our defensive coordinator. Because when we went 8-8 eight eight in 2011, Castillo was the defensive coordinator, and he got fired like mid-season in, in um, 2012, the year we drafted Michael Kendricks. 
So I don't think it was the wide nine, but I think a lot of times my opinion on these players, like when you when you're dealing with a rookie, now this is my thing. You have certain coordinators, now not coaches. I'll get into the coaches in a minute. But coordinators, like defensive coordinators, offensive coordinators, who run special schemes that take it takes special players to run their scheme. You know what I mean? So a lot of these guys, they'll bring in guys to the new team they get hired on that that are familiar with their scheme or this, that, and the third. And they say, okay, I'll bring a couple of my guys in that's familiar with it if we can get them. Now, when Kendricks came in the league, Juan Castillo was our defensive coordinator. He got fired midseason. So, you know, you put Kendricks in a scheme where the defensive coordinator not even experienced like that. He had one one year experience as defensive coordinator. Of course, y'all know because he was the offensive line coach. Now, when I talk about Danny Watkins, and this is the reason I'm speaking on him because I got to bring up Howard Mudd. Now, when Howard Mudd came here to coach the offensive line, Howard Mudd brought a special scheme and a special technique to his way he ran offensive lines. And it worked for Peyton Manning in Indianapolis. But what I try to tell people is you can't put rookies into special schemes and expect them to get it right off the bat when, first of all, he was he was an older guy. He, was, he got drafted when he was like, what, 27 years old. So you're putting him at a disadvantage already because you want him to learn a special scheme that you ran with one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. And sometimes it don't work like that. So I look at it from every angle. Not to say Kendricks was at a disadvantage when he came in the league in his rookie year because he was a pretty good rookie. You know what I mean? Now, switch to next year. Juan Castillo's going. Andy Reid's going. You got Chip Kelly coming in, bringing Billy Davidson, switching the scheme to a three, switching the defensive scheme to a three-four. So, um, you pretty much uh, bring D'Amico Ryan's in. You got Connor Barwin. You have um. You have Trent Cole on the other side, and you got Fletcher Cox, Cedric Thornton, Benny Logan as your front, as your front three. Now Kendrick's pretty much thrived in the three-four, and it wasn't really until his uh, Chip Kelly's last year, 2015, here where you started to see like Kendrick's always had injuries, but in 2013 when they switched to that to that three-four. Him being next to D'Amico Ryans, also a guy who was switching from a 4-3 to a 3-4. But him being next to a, a guy like that with those type of leadership qualities, it really helped him because you had Trent Cole, the experienced guy running um, running the outside linebacker. He was experienced. Connor Barwin thrives in 3-4 defenses at outside linebacker. Connor Barwin, first year, he goes off for 14 and a half sacks. So you pretty much had a set defense. The only problem that year was, you know, Chip Kelly's offensive scheme was so fast paced, but it worked for us that year. So 2013 was a pretty good year for the offense and for the defense. I mean, we still had the last ranked secondary in the NFL, but for the most part, our linebacking core and our front seven was pretty tight. You know what I'm saying? Having Fletcher Cox, having Benny Logan, having Cedric Thornton, like they were conditioned to run on the field a lot being as though we ran a fast-paced offense. So 2013 wasn't really a bad year for Michael Kendricks. Now, like I said, uh, he only missed one game, but he started all the other 15 games he played in. And it was a pretty good year for him. You know what I'm saying? So fast forward to 2014. Now, you get you, you got the same guys coming out. You know what I mean? That was the year Kendricks um, had the calf injury, and I think he missed four games, if I'm not sure. I think. Okay, he started 11 games. He played in 12. So he did miss four games. That was the year, you know, he had the calf injury against the Colts. I think that was the third game. No, the second game. So he missed four games. Now, fast forward to when we lost to Miko Ryans for the year to the Achilles tear. Michael Kendricks came in and was the new D'Amico Ryans. And we pretty much were all right for the rest of the year. We went 10-6 and six again. It's just that Dallas had a better record than us. But... When Kendricks filled in for D'Amico Ryans, he um when he filled in for D'Amico Ryans, he pretty much picked up where D'Amico left off. And it was still a pretty good year. Like our main culprit of our teams is usually the secondary. You know what I'm saying? So 2014 wasn't a bad year either. Like, and I think Kendrick could have probably duplicated what he did in 2013 had he not missed those four games. 
But of course, like I said, one of his one of the cons of Michael Kendricks is he's injury prone. So now, skip for skip pass on the um move on to 2015 where Kendricks he missed three games. Played in 13 and started all 13 games. Now, this was the year um, Shady got traded. Deshaun was already gone. Jeremy Macklin left and went to the um, went to the Chiefs. So, you lost a lot of players. Now, enter Kiko Alonzo. So, now you have Kiko Alonzo, Michael Kendricks, and... Um, I forgot who the other guy was. Um, I'm not sure if we released D'Amico before 2015 started or not. But I don't really... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we drafted Jordan Hicks. Yeah, we did We did release D'Amico Reigns, and they wanted to run this three-linebacker rotation. So aside from the nagging injuries, Kendricks was very inconsistent in 2015. And he actually said in the interview... I, um, you know, I can't really get into a rhythm because they're rotating us so much. Like, it's hard to stay consistent when you're constantly getting rotated in and rotated out out between three linebackers. Now, Kiko Alonso had the knee injury when we first got him. And, you know, he, I think he missed a couple games. But for the most part, from that point on, it just went downhill. Like, people started to see Kendricks as injury prone. He started missing a lot of tackles. He was getting beat by um, running backs. Same thing I defended him for when he filled in for D'Amico Ryans was he's better at covering running backs because they're shorter guys and they're, they're speed guys. He can keep up with them speed-wise, and there's no height disadvantage. So I like Kendricks better in the will, even though it was a 3-4. Um, I like Kendricks better at inside linebacker going up against um, running backs instead of tight ends. So... We lose Jordan Hicks. Miko got released. You know what I'm saying? So Kendricks was in injury. So it was just a bad year. Like we went seven and nine. You know what I'm saying? And everything I'm saying about Kendricks' pros pros and cons. Like a lot of his cons showed up in 2015, and he boiled it down to inconsistency. So because of the rotation. Now 2015, before the year over, Chip Kelly get fired. Billy Davis, I think, I think he um, finished out the year. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. I, I, I forget what happened. But on to 2016. Now you switching back to a 4-3. Now this was Kendrick's worst year since he's been in the NFL. You switching back to a 4-3. You bring in Jim Schwartz, a guy who had a good defensive year with the Buffalo Bills um, two years prior, I, I believe. So we thinking, okay, he gonna run this attack scheme. He runs the wide nine technique too. Something I still feel is a disadvantage for our D line because, you know, I I just rather see a traditional four three like guys lining up where they're supposed to be. And of course, y'all seen last year. You know, we didn't really do that well with the pass rush. I mean, it was all right, but it wasn't what we thought it was going to be. But what I try to tell all our Eagles fans now is most teams run three wide receiver sets. They use their slot receiver a lot more. So a lot of people don't understand Kendrick's situation now, like him asking for the tree, him not playing as much. And a lot of fans just take that and they boil it down to, well, he's not able to get on the field. That's his fault. It's not that. He's the odd man out. Um, Nigel Bradham is a Schwartz guy from Buffalo. Jordan Hicks is our starting um, middle linebacker. You know what I'm saying he's our defensive front, the leader of our front seven. Michael Kendricks comes out. Now last year he played 20, I think 29 percent of the snaps because we run nickel 70 percent of the game. Now if you now for fans that understand nickel, this is not for y'all. But fans that don't understand the nickel package and the base package, Michael Kendricks plays. But due to the fact that offense is put. Their offense out there in three receiver sets, you have to run a nickel package. You got to remove one of the linebackers and add an extra defensive back. So, Kendricks is the odd man now, which is why he only played 29% of the snaps last year. So, you don't see Kendricks as much. He got this contract. 
you trust Nigel Bradham and Jordan Hicks more and then um where you remove Kendrick's when when you go into nickel packages which you play 70% of the game. So here's a guy who two years from move, removed from one of his best seasons barely playing now. Got better contracts than Jordan Hicks and Nigel Bradham. He's barely playing because in the beginning of the year when we when Schwartz came here, he said that um it's all a new scheme to Michael Kendricks, and he's not really caught up on it. Whatever the case is, you know. But I don't know what happened last year. I know we went seven to nine again. We 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 got a brand new quarterback, ran a brand new offense. You know what I'm saying? And we got a brand new defensive coordinator and ran a brand new defense. Now certain guys thrived in that defense. Like I mean, Brandon Graham is pretty much the one standout guy that thrived. Because he went back to his traditional defensive end spot. He wasn't outside linebacker no more. Um, then they put Connor Barwin at defensive end. Moving him out of his traditional outside linebacker spot in the 3-4. So now you got one guy back at his advantage. Another guy back at his disadvantage. You got Kendricks back at his best suited position. But he's not going to play that much. You got Malcolm Jenkins in the nickel. I don't like Jenkins in the nickel. Everybody is not no big secret. Like, you got Malcolm Jenkins playing nickel corner when he should stay at safety, and you should just have find a corner to fill in that nickel when you need to. I know we lost Ryan Brooks last year, but you find another cornerback. Like, this is why good defenses like Seattle thrive, because they have that step up and step off mentality when, they, when one of their key players go down. So if they lose their nickel corner, they're going to plug another nickel corner in there, and he's just going to have to step up or step off. It's not like that here. They they seem to think that putting Malcolm Jenkins in the nickel is a good thing. But all you do is mess up the um, chemistry and the consistency on the back end because Rodney McLeod and Jalen Watkins ain't Rodney McLeod and Malcolm Jenkins. So this is why Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas work so well together because they never, never move them out of position. So Michael Kendricks requests the trade. Understandable to me. Like I understand that completely. Like You're on a team that's not going to play you. Give me a better opportunity and send me somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of fans get mad like he don't want to play here. My mentality when a player asks for a trade is they no longer want to play for you. So you might as well take what you can get for them. Now, if you're trying to trade a player and they have no idea or they're hearing the rumors but it's out of their control, I still think they don't want to play for you no more. If they kind of get some kind of win that that might be true. Their mentality is they don't want to play for you no more. So either way, you had a disadvantage because now word done got out that you're trying to get rid of this player. But when a player requests the trade, they no longer want to be here. They want a better opportunity somewhere else. Now, this is what I wanted to bring to the attention of everybody and the reason I did this video. Nigel Bradham signed a two-year contract. Now, he's 27 years old, so he's not an old guy, so he can always get re-signed. You know what I mean? But we drafted Nathan Jerry. Want to convert him to linebacker. Jordan Hicks is our starter already in the, the man in the middle. Now think about this for a second. Michael Kendricks is 26 years old. Let's say Nigel Bradham doesn't get re-signed. You're going to need another linebacker. And converting Nathan Jerry to linebacker might look good at practice, might look good in training camp or whatever. But you're going to need an experienced guy. Let's say Jordan, God forbid, but injuries come. I'm not going to jinx nobody on the team, but let's say injuries come to a key player. You're going to need guys to fill in. This is why Michael Kendricks, I believe, is still here because we couldn't trade him or um, and we don't want to release him. But then the thing about it, when you can't trade a player, after June 1st, we would have saved a lot more cap money um, by releasing him. But we didn't. Now, I don't know what's going to happen between now and when they cut the roster down to 53, but this is just my point. Let's say Nigel Bradham doesn't re-sign here. You're going to need a linebacker to fill in that strong side linebacker spot. That's what Kendricks played when he came in the league. Now, Nathan Jerry might take that odd man out spot at the will where he only plays 20% of the snaps, but he's only going to be a one-year experience linebacker. So, you might need Kendricks next year. And this is what I want fans to look at. Now, like I said, Nigel Bradham ain't an old guy. He's only 27, so he might get an extension. He might get re-signed. Whatever the case is, but I'm just throwing ideas out there. So I wouldn't get too upset at Michael Kendricks right now because, you know, it's frustrating when you don't play. Like, you play football, you want to play football, 
you want to go out there and you want to shine. You know what I mean? But when you're the odd man out in the defense that's when they run nickel, you know, you want to go somewhere where your opportunity could possibly be better. And you hear about all of these linebackers that, that's injured and these quarterbacks that's injured for the season. And now you see all of these players and it's like, yo, they lost their linebacker. Like, why not try to work out a trade for me to go there? But you see the Eagles still keeping Kendricks around. So that might be, I read it in the article, that might be a front office decision to say we might need this guy in case something happens with one of the guys on our team. Like Nigel Bradham, I don't know what kind of repercussions he's going to face from the issues he had with the assault charge and the gun charge at the airport and things like that. So you never know. Jordan Hicks, he played all 16 games last year. So did Nigel Bradham. I seen in the article, maybe they might not play all 16 games this year. You never know, man. So it's good to keep a guy like Kendricks around for now. I would much rather see him playing since he's getting paid. But that's not up to me. That's up to the coaches and everything. But the whole point of me doing this video is just to discuss with y'all. Like, y'all know me. I always bring the level-headedness to the fan base when they heated about a certain player. Like, I try to reason with the fan base, you know what I'm saying, and get a clear, help them get a clearer understanding of, you know, the good and the bad. So I did this video on Kendricks. He's a pretty good player, man. Like, he's not he's not a bad player. Like, he's a pretty damn good player when he's out there. It's just a matter of how you're going to use him. Like, you got to deal with the injuries. You got to deal with the missed tackles. You got to deal with the inconsistency, you know what I'm saying? But for the most part, Kendricks in a good year where he's not hurt, He's a pretty good player. So it's good to keep a guy like him around, especially for what you're paying him. Unless you can get what you want in a trade. But this is just to let y'all know probably why Michael Kendricks is still on the roster. You know what I'm saying? Now, like I said, I don't know what's going to happen when they do the cut downs and everything. But usually when teams can jump at the opportunity to release a player and save that money, they're going to save the money whether they release him after June 1st whether they release them back then or whether they release them before the season starts. I don't know what they're going to do, but I'm thinking they pretty much holding their hand to see if they can get a last-minute trade or whatever. But for the most part, I wouldn't be mad if Kendrick stayed because if Nigel Bradham don't come back, you're still going to need an experienced linebacker. Like Jordan Hicks is a good linebacker, you know what I'm saying, to have. But it's good keeping a guy like Kendrick's around for now. And that's all I wanted to discuss, man. Like, I'm a... Um, I'm going to get back on here when something else come up. I'll probably do a video about Alshon Jeffrey. Um, my homies want me to do a prediction video. I really don't like doing those because I don't want to say who we're going to win and who we're going to lose to. But I'll be back on here a lot more often in my new spot. Now I'm going to sit by the uh, by where the light at. So I'm going to get at y'all later, man. But that's just um my take on the whole Michael Kendricks fiasco. Hope y'all enjoyed this video. Y'all know me. Subscribe. Show me love. You know what I'm saying? Follow me on Instagram at we underscore bleed underscore green. Twitter, we bleed green 84. I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm on Instagram. A pers I got my personal Instagram. But for the most part, thank y'all all for supporting me. I'm back now. So I'll holler at y'all next time. Peace.